Welcome, everyone. Say, I want to start by just saying, you know, thanks for joining. Glad to have you here this evening. And a big thank you to Amber Weinrich and the Mentor Public Library. Uh, without partnerships with local entities that have, you know, are really connected to the community, people like us, the Nature Conservancy, we can't get our message out. And so we're really grateful for that and grateful for that partnership. Um, so I'm Andrew Bishop. I am the Restoration Manager for the Nature Conservancy in Northeast Ohio, and I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, ecological restoration and, you know, take it right down here into Ohio, uh, into Northeast Ohio, and touch, you know, close to home with Menor. Um, I'm going to spend a little time first just talking about our, our uh, organization, the Nature Conservancy, and uh, and I'm just, yeah, glad to have you along for the ride. The Nature Conservancy, we really view that we're at a turning point. Uh, and so we have a bold vision where we see that if we can go kind of one or two ways, we can kind of do continue as business as usual, or we can take a turn to, to really make efforts to conserve the lands and waters on which all life depends. Uh, it's important to us that we have an optimistic vision. We clear, see clearly that we have the tools and technology to meet that mission. Uh, we, don't, we don't resort to doom and gloom, but it's important for us to really emphasize like, you know, the time is now uh, for us to take action. And a big part of our mission too is that it's nature and people. Really, there's no way to achieve this goal if we view people and nature separately. It's really that uh, they are inseparable and that humans are going to be integral to maintaining natural systems. And those natural systems are what help maintain, you know, humanity on this planet. And so it's really important for us and, and you know, all of us uh, that, that we are able to main, achieve that mission. The Nature Conservancy, we can actually fly under some people's radars. I, you know, I have a lot of conversations with folks where it's like, you work for whom? Uh, but we are really, you know, we have been around for 60 years. We are an inter international conservation nonprofit. We operate in 74 countries, all 50 states. We are known for being science-based and, and innovative. And the Nature Conservancy, we own the largest network of private conservation lands in the United States. So to meet that audacious goal that I outlined at the beginning, uh, we have three major pillars. And these are to tackle climate change, provide food and water sustainably, and protect land and water. And they, these are goals that are across the world and they, they are close to home. And I'm gonna talk about basically how that, how that comes, comes to roost, so to speak, here in Ohio. Uh, and as I was saying, kind of getting to our work in Ohio, it, I'm going to talk a little bit about our properties, uh, kind of those places where you can really appreciate uh, what the Nature Conservancy is all about. And we're going to talk about those pillars and how, how they actually take root in the projects that we do in Ohio and, uh, and where we work and, and how it influences people you know, across Northeast Ohio, but how it influences you directly uh, in Menor, Ohio. So here is a map of our geographical focal areas. And uh, I want to explain a little bit about, you know, what it all means. These are kind of our priority areas are outlined in the, the, the dark kind of maroon brown color. And you can see that our preserves are marked as the green dots. And then our preserves that have uh, public access are marked with brown dots. We also have a stream and wetland mitigation program. Those are shown where they're doing work in the yellow squares. And then we have a couple of other programs, Great Lakes Restoration Initiative projects, agricultural projects, and conservancy legacy programs that are marked in the, the other the other colored you know, triangles, squares, and, and circles. Uh, we have a few focal areas in Southern Ohio. Our focus is on our edge of Appalachia Preserve. 
in central Ohio. We're targeted and most of our activities happen around the Big Darby Preserve. In Northwest Ohio, our, uh, the big area where we work in is the Oak Openings. And then we also have our Great Egret Marsh near Sandusky. And then, you know, right here in Northeast Ohio, our focus is the central Lake Erie Basin. So if you really zoom in, you can see the two areas that are, are highlighted in that brown color. Those are the Grand River watershed and the Cuyahoga River watershed, and that's where we focus most of our efforts. And here in Ohio, Northeast Ohio, we have three preserves that are open to the public and have public trails. And really, what I, part of what I want to do here is just to have this be an open invitation. We want people to come out. We want you to take a stroll on the weekend. We want you to bring a family and really see these places because we think that we protect some of the absolute best that Northeast Ohio has to offer. And there really are uh, gems that, that are, we think it's worthwhile for you to see because you know, we love them so much. So the first preserve I want to talk about as I'm going along in a couple of times, I'm going to pop in some links in the chat if I can successfully, but I might not be able to. I want to be popping in some links in the chat because I know it can be uh, difficult when doing this in Zoom and someone you know has a link in the PowerPoint, but yeah, can't actually click it. So hopefully that one went through. Uh, but that's a link to our nature.org website where there's information about Lucia Nash Preserve. You can figure out how to get there, a little bit more information about it. But Lucia Nash is a 650-acre preserve. It's in Burton, Ohio. It's at the center of a 20,000-acre wetland complex that makes up the headwaters of the Cuyahoga River. Uh, there are beautiful glacial lakes like this one shown here, which is Snow Lake. And that, that 20,000 acre wetland complex is the, it's really the source water for the city of Akron's drinking water. Uh, and part of that preserve is Snow Lake and that's uh, open to the public. We have a public trail there. And it opened just recently amidst the pandemic. And so we didn't get to have quite the fanfare that we were hoping for to really, you know, let people know about its opening but there's we have an accessible trail and a really terrific boardwalk that you can get out on out uh, a little bit into the lake and get a feel for it and hopefully uh, hear or see sandhill cranes bald eagle osprey just some terrific wildlife at lucian ash uh, then we have our j arthur herrick preserve and this is a 140-acre preserve in Streetsboro, Ohio. It, uh, it has a one-mile boardwalk trail. Uh, and what's great about fens, and this fen in particular, is they have a, a certain geology, a glacial geology, that creates unique groundwater that is rich in calcium and magnesium. And these uh, it, it makes the water alkaline. And when you have that alkaline water, it supports a rare assemblage of plants. And so we see just some really cool plants. It's a, it's a plant lover's paradise. Me as a, someone who's interested in botany and who enjoys that kind of thing, this is uh, a really great place to, to go spend time on the boardwalk, see the plants growing there and, and the, you know, the different wildlife that are taking advantage of it. All right, next, next up is our Morgan Swamp Preserve. The Morgan Swamp is it's a 2,000 acre preserve. And so it's really like our, what I would say is our flagship preserve in Northeast Ohio. Um, and you can see I just shared uh, that, that link to our nature.org website, but it's in the Grand River Lowlands up in Ashtabula County. It's near Rock Creek, Ohio. And we have the Long Pond Trailhead where we have a trail as well as our Grand River Conservation Campus. And I'll talk a little bit about that in the next slide. But this preserve, it, it is centered around a large wetland complex that has uh, bogs, there's some bend communities, a lot of uh, great swamp. And I, I say really like great swamp. I know not everyone uh, 
we, we hope to change the misconceptions that swamps are places you don't want to be, but instead they're actually fantastic places that we, we want people to see because they preserve really unique habitats that support uh, a wealth of biodiversity and rare plants. And one of the most interesting communities there is our hemlock birch swamp. That's a eastern hemlock and birch, yellow birch trees kind of make up that community. And this is a, a community that is really more often found in far, far northern Canada. Um, and so it, it's really a holdout of the retreating glaciers and that lake effect snow that we get in Ashtabula County. So as I was saying, uh, at the heart of the Morgan Swamp is our Grand River Conservation Campus. We've got a mile and a half of public trails uh, a canoe launch, a playground, a pavilion, and a gym that can be reserved. Our Dr. James K. Bissell uh, Nature Center. It's the only nature center in Ashtabula County. It, we provide free field trips uh, to local schools, and it's in the midst of a, a capital improvement project that's going to increase the opportunities that we can provide to the local community. Of course, with COVID, we have not been able to open the Nature Center uh, to public access, but we do have um, programming that we've done through Zoom and, uh, and also the, the campus is open. And we are you know, eagerly looking forward to being able to reopen the Nature Center and have you know, kids out there to really learn about uh, the real local uh, ecology and wildlife that we have there, but also just general information about, you know, our, our special places in Northeast Ohio. <clears throat> so those are our public preserves, and they're a major part of our priority. But we work outside these preserves. Uh, having these goals means that we have to collaborate. We, we can't work in isolation. We, we need to work with partners. And, and it's we want to work with partners. And so a good bit of what we do uh, to, to achieve these three pillars is working in policy and working with partners. And right now uh, in, North, in the Nature Conservancy in Ohio is in a five-year campaign to really ramp up our efforts uh, to drive fundraising to help us reach these, these big goals uh, because we think the time is now and it's their critical goals. So the first piece that, that we say there is that addressing climate change, our target is to reduce emissions by 26%. We do a lot of this through policy and trying to have that carbon reduction policies. We also uh, see that we can gain a lot of these benefits uh, in doing improved forest management, essentially to have adaptation to climate change as well as mitigation. We can sequester a lot of carbon through proper forest management. And a big thing is that climate change can't be viewed as a partisan issue. We see it as nonpartisan. There's a scientific consensus and, and we, we need people to, to recognize it and see that our best path forward is to work together on solutions. So protecting water in Ohio is really important. Water is so important to our economy, so important to our the enjoyment of our lives and our livelihoods. Uh, you know, in Lake Erie, we have just a world class sports fishery. We uh, and we're so we have work focused um, on agriculture and working with farmers to identify you know smarter ways to use nutrients, ways to reduce the amount of phosphorus going into Lake Erie that uh, so that we don't have the same harmful algal bloom uh, impacts that we've had recently. And we want to work with uh, farmers and landowners to identify you know, marginal croplands and do restoration of wetlands in those areas, work with uh, landowners and farmers on uh, agricultural drainage, and, and basically use natural solutions. Because in addition to reducing the phosphorus. When we use those natural solutions, they have many other benefits that spill over and things support biodiversity and, and really helps to increase the, the supply of those benefits of nature, those things that we don't pay for, like 
clean water, clean air, uh, pollination of our crops, but that are so important and, and too often taken for granted. And so we have a, a real focus on these resilient habits, habitats, and those are areas that are going to do best under climate change. So we have an intention to you know, improve management of lands that are resilient and to increase the connections between areas that are resilient. Our work in, our work in Northeast Ohio really brings together that aspect of the protecting fresh water, our climate adaptation, as well as the connecting of the resilient habitats. And to kind of like really take drive that message home, it's all about having a diverse array of plants and animals, because as I was saying, those are the drivers of those benefits of nature. And really just a couple of facts here about forests and what they do, how are they filtering and, filtering and cleaning our water supplies. I already mentioned the city of Akron's water supply. You know, uh, so many of our cities right here on Lake Erie get their water from Lake Erie. And they're also a place to recreate. They, they also, you know, sequester carbon. So in talking about improved management and talking about resilience, I realized that, you know, I'm, I'm bandying about uh, some jargon. And so what is resilience? It, it's really the idea that a, a system, an ecosystem can bounce back. And I say it maintains form and function. Uh, essentially, your know, form is if I go into that forest, does it look the same even after there's been a major disturbance event? And function is when I when we measure again those benefits of nature, are is a, the system still able to provide them in the same way as before a major disturbance event? And those disturbance events can be things like fire. They can be uh, insect outbreaks. Uh, a great example that many people uh, are you know felt personally is you know, emerald ash borer. <clears throat> it can be climate change. You know, the things like microbursts, flooding, droughts, what they are predicting as an impact of climate change here in, in Northeast Ohio in the Midwest is a greater number of those extreme weather events going from major rainfalls to then periods of drought. And what we need to be able to maintain those functions through that are our forests and, and ecosystems that can bounce back. And so if we're talking about managing forests or managing habitats, we're looking at diversity. Uh, diversity is basically one way to see it as nature's insurance policy. It's that idea that if you had a forest that was just, you know, just emerald or just ash and emerald ash borer comes through, then you basically don't have a forest anymore after all of those trees are killed. We want to see that, uh, yeah, that you have a, that variety both in the species and the structure of a forest. And then we manage for habitats that are able to, you know, support healthy streams and have healthy wetlands that can filter that water and transport water uh, without carrying you know, pollutants into our Great Lake. Uh, I have this picture here in the background, and this is showing basically a, a low resiliency forest. This was a, a farm, uh, or maybe it was, yeah, it, it was basically, it was in row crop agriculture. And uh, the, for whatever reason, the farmer stopped uh, using it. And you see it, it basically became a low diversity forest. There's only a couple of species in here. And the trees are mostly all within the same age range. On top of it, the understory that you can see here, at a quick look, it looks green, that's nice. It's all multiflora rose, which is a, an invasive species. And with that invasive species dominating the understory, there is very little regeneration of new trees that will basically be the forest of the future. So I'm gonna talk, that that's a little bit about kind of our, our we, we went through our preserves, we talked about our goals, and then I'll talk about a couple projects that that are helping us achieve those goals. 
The first one I want to talk about is our Great Lakes Fish and Wildlife Restoration Act project. This is a grant that we have with a number of partners working to improve habitat for eastern Massasago rattlesnake. These, this species uses uh, diverse wet meadows, uh, and these habitats are also important for things like star-nosed moles, uh, sandhill cranes, uh, the ermine like you see in this photo. And so this project is focused in the Grand River lowlands close to our Morgan Swamp Preserve and um, on uh, some other partner lands. And we're doing things like controlling invasive species, removing woody species, keeping this in a, in a meadow state. And we're tracking progress. We have a special vegetation analysis to track how it's working. And we have this cool camera trap system where this fence, this metal flashing fence, directs animals into a camera trap. And that's where you're seeing that, that ermine there, the, the white weasel captured by uh, a photo monitoring trap. It doesn't physically trap them, it just takes their picture. And what we're doing with this is in addition to improving the habitat and helping this threatened, federally threatened species, we're using these sites as demonstration sites so we can uh, teach and share what we've learned with partners, conservation partners, and also private landowners. Uh, another project we're working on is our Eastern Hemlock Conservation Program. Eastern Hemlocks are threatened by two invasive species. They are elongate hemlock scale, which is shown in the picture. They're on the underside of the hemlock needles here, these little tan uh, oval shaped dots. And then also on this other picture, the hemlock woolly adelgid uh, that has the white puffy uh, look at the base of the, of the needles. And these two species, they will eventually kill the eastern hemlock. If you think about hemlock, I already mentioned our hemlock swamp there in Morgan Swamp, uh, but they also grow in, in some really fabulous ravines. And you know, a lot of us like to spend some time in, the, in those ravines. They, they're cool, they're moist, they are peaceful. And it turns out a lot of different species benefit from those uh, habitats as well. And so we're working across Northeast Ohio We've surveyed nearly 2,000 acres of hemlock forest looking for these pests, and we've uh, treated trees to protect them from these two pests. So, you know, some of the partners we work with might be places that you're familiar with, places that you like to recreate, uh, and we work with the Cleveland Metro Parks at their North and South Sugar and Reservation, of course, at our Morgan Swamp, which is pictured in the lower left. And we also work with Lake Metro Parks at a number of their preserves, but places like Hell Hollow uh, and Chapin Forest, and also the Holden Arboretum, their Little Mountain, and uh, Stebbins Gulch. So here's a map showing our priority areas for that project. And you can see Mender right there um, with the big orange star. But just south, coming south from Mender, you see a little red star. And that's actually a location where in 2017, both the hemlock woolly adelgid and the elongate hemlock scale were found, uh, actually at Little Mountain in uh, Holden Arboretum's property. And so radiating out from that point are uh, a series of five mile buffers. And then you can see the different color coded properties are basically conservation lands that have hemlock on them and they're color coded based on their, their ownership. But, so we're working with all these different partners across this whole area. And it's, if there's a place that has hemlock that you, you like, it, it's very likely that we've been there and we've been you know, working to preserve those hemlock into the future. And now finally, really getting close to home here, our Sustain Our Great Lakes grant. And this is uh, a project where we're focusing on maintaining the benefits from our from a series of past Great Lakes Restoration Initiative uh, partnerships in the Grand River and the Lake Erie Coast. And this is a, a grant that we have through the Fish and Wildlife uh, Foundation. So going back to 2011, TNC has collaborated with a number of conservation partners to control invasive species in, in this focal area. And we have this uh, two-year project that began in March of 2021 
and we're focused on you know dune communities we're focused on the grand river wetlands riparian areas so those streamside areas and what we're really doing is returning to places where in those past grants we did invasive species control to help improve the functioning of uh, of these places and also going to newly acquired properties that our partners have acquired so that we can essentially continue the benefits uh, from that initial work and continue to meet our, those global goals. So uh, I've I mentioned it a bit before, several times you've probably heard me say collaboration, uh, but really conservation of the scale, it's a must to collaborate. We So we work with a number of different partners, and on this map, you can see in the center, you've got the Grand River, and all the different stars are representing specific uh, properties where we're doing invasive species control. And you also can see the stars running along the Lake Erie coast uh, in some places that are um, high diversity, have big impacts on water quality, and really have a benefit for fish and wildlife. So I'm just going to take a moment to talk about a couple, just three of our, our partners properties that I think are, are real gems and just give us you a sense of like places you might know and, and recognize and, and, and have spent some time in to show you, you know, where we're working and how this work looks on the ground. Menor Marsh is, uh, is a place I hope is, uh, you know, close to everyone's heart. And our partner, the Cleveland Museum of Natural History, has really made a, uh, just an amazing transformation of this site from what was a, uh, what we would call a monoculture, a place that had only one species, Phragmites. Uh, and they really just turned that monoculture into a masterpiece. And it's, of course, a, a work in progress, but they've spent um, you know, years planting more than 20,000 plugs, uh, more than 20 million seeds. I love it that someone did that calculation. And if you haven't heard uh, David Kriska talk about all that they have learned and the experiences they've had in restoring Menor Marsh, uh, you really uh, should find one of his, his talks because it's really just fantastic. Um, so what we're doing is we are helping to continue this work they are a partner of ours on this project where you know, just this week, actually, we had folks out uh, treating cattail out at the marsh to, to help with the success. And what is, you know, the reason, the, the why here is this is making what is the, the largest estuary um, wetland in, on Lake Erie, we're making it really more functional. We're make, increasing the diversity of not just plants, but you know, plants are at the base of that food chain and everything that, that relies on those plants and really building it up. Another great spot that you know, maybe you've canoed down the, the lower grand and had a chance to, to swing past is Lake Metro Parks Indian Point. We're working with Lake Metro Parks on a number of properties, but I think this is a, a real gem we're controlling invasive species on uh, the floodplain in this area. There's a real diverse flood plain. And, you know, this is just a great spot with those, you know, nearly 700, well, 628 acres. You've got access to the river. You can camp there. If you haven't participated in Lake Metro Parks camping program, um, I have, and I, I really think it's awesome. You gotta, if you want a weekend slot, you gotta be ready to jump on them. But um, I, I really just feel like I can't say enough good things about our partners um, and, and Lake Metro Parks is really one of them. Geneva State Parks are just a, a little further east from Menor. They have you know, terrific estuaries, really high potential dune habitat. Uh, of course, the great beaches and it's an important spot for migratory birds. Estuaries are those places where a stream or a river comes into a lake or the ocean, in this case, obviously a lake. And they're really critical for migratory birds, for uh, you know, marsh birds, and also for a number of different species, fish species, like lake fish, fish species that rely on those estuaries for their spawning habitat. Dunes are really 
an endangered habitat on Lake Erie just because of the level of development along the lake. And given that, they support an added amount of diversity that we just don't see living in other places because of that special, unique habitat, that habitat that's really actually hard to live in. And what we have at uh, Geneva State Park is a lot of Phragmites. It's really at risk uh, of Phragmites and we can do so much by controlling it. And that's, that's the big goal at this site is for us to get that Phragmites under control so the dune habitat and the estuaries can really live up to their full potential. So that was just a little tour of a couple of the spots. Um, what I wanted to add, uh, or, you know, I want to give you that and then just kind of break down like, so wait, what's the big deal? What is an invasive species? Why are, why are we doing this? Why does it matter? So big thing about invasive species is they were moved to, you know, here, we, the ones that we're dealing with are here because humans move them. Um, and they cause harm. It can be environmental harm, economic harm, or they can have impacts to human health. Some of the top invasive species we deal with uh, are shown here. Some of the, the ones focused uh, in on wetland areas are your cattails, uh, the Phragmites, which I've referenced. It's also called common reed, Phragmites is the genus. Reed canary grass, buckthorn, uh, Japanese knotweed. These are a, a couple of our, our main contenders. It's just super aggressive. In our upland forest systems or like our riparian forest, so those, again, the stream side or riverside forest, we, we have issues with garlic mustard, uh, lesser celandine, multiflora rose, and then we have a couple of different bush honeysuckle species that, uh, that we deal with. So, you know, some of the questions are like, you know, what, why? Why, why do they, are they a challenge? They, most of them are naturally aggressive they produce a great number of seeds or they can reproduce from fragments of the plant or they spread from what are called rhizomes that are essentially it's like your grass in your lawn that it spreads by uh, the roots and, and forms a turf. They thrive on disturbance so I have this picture in the background of a beach this is a place where you know you have storms you got the wind you sometimes uh, people stomping on it and all these different things that are constantly making it hard to live there. But invasive species do really well in those places where there's not established competitive vegetation. And then another fun one, you know, add it to your, uh, you know, word list is allelopathy. That is, those are, plants have chemicals that they exude from the roots or as their, the old vegetation breaks down that actually makes it harder for other plants to grow in that spot. Uh, another big thing is, I said in the last slide, you know, people brought them here two slides ago. But uh, when, when people decided like, oh, I think we want, sometimes that was intentional, sometimes it was an accident. But when it happened, uh, no one was sitting there saying, well, we need to bring along the different pests and disease that, uh, that go along with this plant. So they didn't. And without those controls without predation, without disease, without uh, you know competitors, there they run rampant. And oftentimes here we find that very few things, very few you know native uh, animals will eat them. So why do we care about invasive species? Um, many of you uh, you know might be aware of this little thing that has happened a few times. Men are marsh catching on fire. This is a picture from 2003 of the Phragmites growing in the marsh before uh, the restoration. And this fire was completely unnatural. It wouldn't have happened without Phragmites there and without arson. Uh, but the, another piece can be, well, I, I skipped it. They, they disrupt natural processes. So basically they change the way fire happens in a system or they make it where fire happens in a system where it wouldn't normally. Another thing that they change in other process is succession. Uh, if we go back, I had that example of a farm field that grows up into a forest. Uh, and oftentimes invasive species will prevent uh, native trees from getting established. And so you'll end up in a situ situation we call arrested succession. 
where a field stays a field or a field stays a shrubland because it's dominated by the, inv the invasive species. In addition, many of them can contribute to soil erosion and water quality issues. They can be very aggressive, but oftentimes don't have really substantial roots to hold soil. And so when we have these storm and flood events, it'll wash soil into the waterways and soil is one of our biggest uh, pollutants. And the, the big thing with biodiversity, when you have less plant diversity, uh, that's the base of that food chain, that, that pyramid, right? And without that plant diversity, you have fewer bugs and then you have few, you know, less wildlife that we all like to see. And that really does things for us that we, we appreciate. So uh, other reasons to care about invasive species, uh, you can read these, but I'll just emphasize, uh, you know, the, the news articles here, you, uh, just this year, there's a man in Cincinnati that was in the hospital for 40 days because he was trying to remove poison hemlock from his yard. There's also, there's a, a few different species that are, are poisonous. And then there's some studies that have shown that there's a greater density of ticks around the invasive species Japanese barberry and the different bush honeysuckle species. And so, you know, uh, kind of having that understanding of why invasive species are important, what, what they do, you know, this is just a little bit about what TNC does to, uh, to manage them. Uh, the first step, you know, is prevention. If we don't have new invasive species, then we have a lot less of a problem to deal with. And, and that's, you know, a big part of why I'm here today, wanting to talk to people and just uh, educate. Uh, I have a picture there of a boot brush. A big thing is, you know, when you go, we go into natural areas that might, that are invaded within a species, you can get seeds, you can get root fragments on your boots and transfer them to another place. Another piece of management is detection. It's a lot cheaper to control an invasive species when it's a small population than when it's 800 acres of Phragmites at the Menor Marsh. And then management, that's, that's our big uh, you know, emphasis of doing control. Restoration is after we've done control measures to remove invasive species, sometimes we have to repair underlying issues. Sometimes there's hydrologic issues in a wetland that make it more likely that invasive species would thrive there. Uh, and other times we just need to do uh, replantings, get established a native community that can compete with those invasive species and help reduce our management efforts in the future. So some of how, what management looks like, um, you know, we can do mechanical treatments. That's things like mowing, hand pulling, that works for some species, or maybe it can be part of a control method in combination with things like uh, herbicides. Sometimes fire is a tool that's employed. Uh, herbicide applications are really a big part of what we do. Uh, you see here in the two pictures on the top right, the individual there is doing hand wicking, where essentially when we know we have sensitive species that we don't want to harm, we can apply herbicides very directly to just the problem plant. Uh, and then this lower picture is a shot of a, uh, an Argo, which is an amphibious uh, ATV that we are able to drive through marshes with and, and along streams. And we can apply herbicides because there's a good uh, 30 gallon tank that allows us to get a lot done and really make a big impact. And then um, something I won't get into too much, but another option that some uh, sometimes is employed and not really by us here at TNC in Northeast Ohio is biocontrol. Um, there's a couple of different pests that basically people, researchers have gone back and looked where do these uh, invasive species come from? And they've identified what are some of the species that uh, eat that? And, and they do studies on make sure that they don't have an impact, it won't harm plants here. And then they might introduce those biocontrols. So what can you do? Uh, I mean, I think that's always, you know, we all got to have that call to action. And the big first thing I want to put in there is explore, you know, and just like shamefully putting my kids here on display. Uh, but you know, just getting outside and taking it in, having that appreciation for it. Uh, you know, we, uh, we raise monarchs. And this is my son, you know, releasing an adult monarch. 
But I think that's a ter terrific way to just be connected to nature. Uh, we really, I think it's essential um, for us to be successful. Learn and document. We have some really great tools. We live in this technological age where we can do just so much. And so I, um, I put in here iNaturalist. This is an app that you can download. Uh, you can snap pictures and then share them with a worldwide network of people that can help you identify them. And that gives us, that can give managers a lot of information about what is uh, in the places where we manage. Uh, and another good one is the, the Bugwood apps, Great Lakes Early Detection Network app. And this is um, in the midst of just kind of popping it in the chat as we speak. But this is a, a really good one, especially for invasive plants as well as animals. And in that you can document something that uh, if that if you know it's it's non-native, you can pop it out there. And again, managers can then see uh, what what is on their landscape, what are the concerns, uh, without them having to get out there and find it, because there just there are too many acres and not enough of us that are out managing the land. Having a favorite place. This is, I mean, how can you not? love the spot right this is our snow lake preserve but it, it's really important i think to you know go visit somewhere regularly really get involved go there in all seasons know what it looks like from day to day week to week month to month you'll be able to see the changes that happen at that place and you could become the expert in a spot just by going for a stroll you can go on guided walks you know take your family but also get involved the Nature Conservancy in Ohio, we have a number of volunteer opportunities for people to, you know, can be one-off events or you can really get involved and, and have that special place. And so I popped in, as we've been going here, I popped in a couple things, but um, just put in the volunteering pages website and our uh, volunteer email is just about to go in as well. And then, um, you know, when you really take it close to home, it, it starts with, you know, our, our cities, our towns, our suburbs, our farms, they all need to have more space for biodiversity and natural processes. The human dominated landscape needs to soften uh, to meet those goals that I outlined are, 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 you know, big audacious goals. And so what you can do at home is, you know, for starters, don't plant the next weed. You don't you take a little time to educate yourself uh, about what, what are the invasive species in our state. You can use some of the resources that I'm going to paste in here. We, there's a iNaturalist uh, guide that is all about invasive species in Ohio. There is the, one of our partners, the Lake Erie Allegheny Partnership for Biodiversity, has a you know, page all about planting native plants. The, uh, and, and in addition, you know, I, I have in a shrinking year long, making your space more natural, planting native plants. And, and a great option also is doing things like a rain garden or, you know, a different way to capture stormwater. Because what's great about rain gardens to me is you can have natives in there and you can also capture stormwater that helps us to have, you know, clean, pure water. And so I posted into the chat, the, uh, one of the collaboratives we're a part of is the Central Lake Erie Basin Collaborative. And this is a, a number of watershed groups that work together to magnify their impact. But you know, check out their website, find your local watershed group, uh, get involved with them or get involved with your uh, soil and water conservation district. They have great programs that actually can make it really affordable to do a lot of this. Sometimes there are uh, you know, sales and giveaways that can, um, get you native plants. And I have this book here by Doug Tallamy, Bringing Nature Home. It just really gives you a deep dive into why this matters and, and the science and the learning that we've done to understand of how big of an impact uh, each of us can have. And that's, that's a big part of our message at the Nature Conservancy too, and our idea about inspiring people for nature is that uh, our actions matter. We do have an impact.
Uh, it can feel small, but we can really make our bit of our backyard uh, a much nicer place. And, and I put these shots in here, actually in my yard, just to show it doesn't take much space. I've got these small, this small, you know, two foot wide strip between, you know, my driveway and my neighbor's house and it's thriving with native plants. Oh, and I also just wanted to put in a plug there for Monday, August 2nd, backyard stewardship with chasing bugs. That was so great uh, that Amber shared that at the beginning. Um, what a great way to take a deep dive and get, you know, a better understanding of uh, what you can do close to home. Uh, you know, something else you can do is uh, connect with TNC. We're on, you know, social media. Uh, we've, got, we've got the Facebook and, uh, and we're on Twitter and um, Instagram. And you can, so I'll pop a couple more things into the chat. You know, we're at nature uh, underscore Ohio on Twitter. We are, um, I'll pop in the link for Facebook, but you can also, you know, you can join the Nature Conservancy. We have a great magazine. You can become a donor. Those are definitely, if you, you know, like the message, if you believe in, you know, I guess what I'm, what I'm putting down, um, then that's definitely something that we would appreciate and it would show that, uh, that our message, our goals are resonating with people. And so I'm putting in just a, one more link here to, uh, yeah, it's for you to be able to see like our, our donation page if that's something you're interested in. But, um, you know, with that, that's uh, what I had to share with folks. I hope that, that, that this has been enjoyable and uh, I'm happy to take any questions people might have. Um, someone asked, do you ever let scouts camp at your preserves or help with the projects? Oh, very good question. I don't think that we have had scouts camping on our preserves, but we definitely uh, greatly encourage participation. Uh, and that can be, uh, we've had partnerships with Eagle Scouts, but also um, scouts at different levels to do a variety of partnerships. And that's, a, I think, a pretty natural partnership. Uh, you got an organization that's all about people being outside, you know, young people being outside and learning. Um, and we want to encourage that. Um, another one, it's, it's kind of a comment, but also kind of a question. It said the, the Geneva State Park photo looks more like a marina than an estuary. Uh, you know, that's a great point uh, that that photo is off to the left hand side, there is an estuary there and there are a couple other estuaries as part of the park. It's the marina is one of the more recognizable spots and I liked the fact that I could pick out some of the places where I knew there were was invasive phragmites as well as uh, the estuary there as well. But very good question or observation too. Um, and then another question that just popped up and so I am happy to tell people over and over again it's what is the date for the backyard stewardship program? Uh, it is Monday, August 2nd at 6.30 p.m. Uh, and again, that, that it will be a Zoom program. So uh, that will be recorded also. So it's the whole, you, you still have time to register. And then if so, something happens and you're not able to be there, uh, it will be recorded and then posted to our social media as well. So I think we're good. I, I hope everyone is, uh, you know, taking the time to take down Andrew's email address. That way, if you do think of questions, you can always ask him. Um, same thing, if you think of stuff too, you can always ask us at the library and we will track down, you know, whoever we need to, to answer. So um, other than that, I thank everyone for coming. And again, the uh, Backyard Stewardship Program is August 2nd at 6.30 p.m. Um, and then otherwise, uh, you know, that you can call us, you can go online or anything like that to, to sign up for that. Yeah. Thanks everyone for joining. I really appreciate the audience. Yep. Thanks guys.